As a social science, we humans and our behaviors are at the heart of every theoretical either outcome or driving factor that we look at in political science, international relations, or in other social sciences. And in this class, we have tasked ourselves with understanding the drivers of civil conflict and human security and bring in how background, structural, economic factors can uh, drive conflict. So we're building a foundation. This foundation has many different parts. In the first part of this class, we focused on general economic explanations for conflict at the individual level and at the national level. We looked at political institutions, often at the, at the national level, that can shape the likelihood of conflict. Last week, we introduced uh, environmental factors and how they interacted with those economic and political factors to better give us the framework for this second part of the class. In the second part of the class, I am really interested to get your feedback and um, questions about specific uh, environmental elements um, and social elements and how they both directly and indirectly shape the uh, the the outcome that we've focused on in this class civil conflict we can in your own research or in other classes apply similar environmental and human security arguments to different outcomes whether it's uh, protests who wins elections uh, levels of development if, if you're interested in economics but in this class we're building a model of the causes of civil conflict and so today I thought it would be appropriate to start with um, tying back to David Foster Wallace's speech in week one, the, the most water part of our understanding of conflict, and that is us uh, human beings and three specific characteristics of our life on earth, uh, population uh, density, the nature and size of different population groups, and how they might have different incentives for the use of conflict, as well as our movement within countries to more uh, urban centers. And this will provide some useful context for subsequent weeks when we turn to what happened when people start uh, moving. The, a common theme in this class has been to we focus on level or change. So in this class, in this week, we're going to be looking at level population uh, levels and characteristics that are more static over time. And then next week, we'll turn to migration. What happens when people move? And there is a possibility in each one of these weeks that these kind of building blocks that we're putting together to create our theoretical model of conflict something is going to jump out jump out to you something is going to be different something that is really going to connect with you your interests your background and the the factor that you would want to focus on for your own research or that um for uh this class or other classes really shape how you understand that so it's not uh as comparable as as uh, the rest of these kind of blocks or in creating that kind of um, complex theoretical model like Thomas Homer Dixon and others that we've seen in this class, but it's something different, right? Uh, typified here by a, uh, by a head of garlic. And I think in this class, what we're trying to do is both see the water for what it is, the background structural conditions that can shape all of our lives, as well as try to spark interest to try to find that one unique factor uh, that stands out to you that is different from the other ones that you would really want to uh, focus on in, in more detail or the one that you really find the most compelling one. And I don't know what that is. We are all different. I have my own interests uh, and you do as well. But this has the possibility, if I can do this, to make all the rest of them uh, less relevant. And I want you to be able to know what all those factors are, how they uh, are put together by different um, by different writers and um, by different uh, people in different contexts. But the goal is 
to give you that kind of structure to understand it, but then also allow you to find your passion, your interests, uh, to be able to knock down that water and enable you to choose that topic that you want to know more about. Oh, that doesn't, that wasn't as satisfying as I thought. I thought the chicken was going to fall. Anyway, uh, awkward analogies aside, I think today the focus is an on an uncomfortable truth. For those Marvel fans out there, this is the kind of Thanos approach to environmental problems. There's just too many people uh, around, and these people are creating population pressures. Thomas Malthus wrote about this a couple of centuries ago, and in the readings for this week and in the lecture, there is a common theme. The uh, the Gleditch article that we read for this week talked about the neo-Malthusians, the, the pessimists and the optimists, right? To what extent population pressures are fundamental to understand this uh, potential or actual spike uh, in conflict, or whether there have been uh, changes uh, so far uh, technologically uh, or otherwise that have enabled humanity to sidestep uh, the kinds of um, challenges that Malthus uh, um, saw coming. And so the, the puzzle is we have almost 8 billion people in the world. If it's not going to hit 8 billion this year, it will within the next uh, couple of years. And so like with other environmental factors we'll look at in this class, people have said uh, these population pressures are going to have an inevitable link to increasing violence. However, there really hasn't been strong evidence for uh, these connections. And so we're going to look at a couple of cases in which the argument has been made that population pressures have um, caused conflict and then look at the other factors, the interactive factors then can exacerbate those relationships or offset them. So um, uh, today, I guess the question is, um, why hasn't Malthus uh, proved right? Why don't we have any wars of all against all? I wanna start with um, basic background information about population uh, levels uh, and change to kind of provide us the, the building blocks for a theoretical understanding of population characteristics. After this video, I would suggest you watch the, um, the Science Magazine video. They did a much better job. They have a much better uh, graphics budget than I do to be able to provide you the background information about where we are, where we've come. And then I will provide a couple of my own uh, statistics and uh, facts that I think will be useful for our discussion in the workshop as well as later on this week. Um, then we'll be turning to the case study of Rwanda. It is one that you've likely seen in other classes if you've taken conflict or international relations or, or genocide classes. And the, one of the readings for this week by Percival and Homer Dixon looks within two years of the genocide actually happening to see whether it is environmental pressures due to population density uh, were important to understand the intensity of the violence in 1994. The section after that will look at uh, youth bulges and their potential effect on conflict. Not everyone is as equally likely to go to conflict, uh, to, to join conflict for the opportunity cost arguments and the greed and grievance arguments that we talked about in, in week two. And then um, we'll talk about the unparalleled amount of urbanization we have seen in the last 50 years and what trends that might uh, unleash on the, the potential for, for drivers uh, of conflict. And then we'll end with the case study of uh, the Gaza Strip, because I think it's one in which you have a multitude of these different factors. Let's see if I can get the rest of them down. Yeah, I got the chicken, but I think I scratched my bookcase. Um, as, uh, as a case in which you have a bunch of these different uh, factors in, in driving both the, the ongoing struggle with the Israeli state, but then also um, absolute and relative pressures that can also create um, difficulties going forward. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Please check out that Science Magazine video, and I'll see you right back here.